on this episode of Pawn Stars. It's a doctor's blood sugar test kit from the 40s. It's like in perfect condition. Two different kinds of cyanide in those bottles, so. Uh... OK, all right, all right. So we don't want to test that. <laughs> <laughs> It's an aquatic etching by Joan Moreau. 12,000 is what I like to get for it. It is cool, but he's one of the most faked artists around from this period of time. Seven <sighs> barrels and one gun. It's a shotgun on a lot of drugs. I'm feeling comfortable that we can actually shoot this thing. I definitely want to shoot it. Good luck, chum. Hope you like your fingers. At my shop, family comes first and money comes second, depending on who you ask. But the best part, you never know what's going to come through that door. This is Pawn Stars. All right, what do we have here? What I have here is a doctor's blood sugar test kit from the 40s. It was made by the Lamont Company. It's like in perfect condition. Um, Whatever chemicals were in here. There are two different kinds of cyanide in those bottles, so. Uh... OK, all right, all right. So we don't want to touch that. <laughs> <coughs> My father has diabetes, and so this piece was interesting to me to see what people used to have to go through just to get this test and how far medical advancement has come. But I don't collect medical items, so I thought someone who has a medical background would probably appreciate it more than me. This is really neat. They basically knew about diabetes for hundreds of years. You know, they eventually figured out it was your pancreas, but there wasn't a practical blood test, really. I mean, if you look at everything going on here just to test your blood, you can't do that five or 10 times a day. No, this was a lot of work. You know, eventually it got simpler and simpler. There's no cure for it, but they're making life with diabetics a little bit easier. Right. 175 milligrams per 100 cc's. Uh those are actually test tubes with the colors in it that indicated what your blood sugar level was. Yeah, this is... A pipette. A pipette. A pipette. I'm not 100% sure how they used them. Well, usually you put your stuff right in there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sell it? I do want to sell it. OK, how much do you want for it? Well, I'd like to get 450 for it. OK. In the world of medical collectibles, this is not old. You know, the newer you get, the less rare they are, and as far as the collectors go, they're not as desirable. So I'd give you like 75 bucks. Ooh. Generally, I sell this stuff to doctors, OK? Right. And they want a great story how this was insane medicine. This was actually good medicine, just a little bit complicated. Understandable. You wouldn't be willing to go any higher, like 250 Nope. No? I'll go 90 bucks. Yeah. It means more to me than 90 bucks. OK. Well, thanks for bringing it in. I appreciate it. No, thanks for seeing it. All right, no problem. I'm a little disappointed that I was unable to make a deal today, but I'm going to hang on to this kit for a while and enjoy it and appreciate what it meant in medical history. How you doing? Good. What do you have here? It's an aquatic etching by Moreau, Joan Moreau. OK. It looks really cool. Definitely. I really like Moreau. He's one of my favorite artists. It's simple, but yet your subconscious still thinks, what could this be, you know? This could be a kite, this could be a row, this could be anything, you know? Like, it really gets you thinking, what could this be? $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Moreau at an auction about 14 years ago. I want to sell the Moreau because I am traveling now with my wife, so it's either sell it or find a permanent home for it until we settle down. I'm selling the Moreau for $12,000. I'd be willing to go as low as $10,000. If I sell the Moreau today, I'll take my wife on a belated honeymoon, and I'll probably spend the rest of the money on the house. It is pretty cool. Do you know a date on it or anything like that? No idea. I don't know the title, the date. All I know is it's titled 49 out of 50, so I assume it's an edition of 50. OK, yeah, it definitely is in typical Moreau fashion. I mean, he was a pretty interesting artist. He was from Catalonia, Spain, traveled around, first went to Paris in the 1920s. He was around artists like Dolly, Picasso, and he experimented in all different types of mediums. But really what he's known for is his lithograph work, you know, these primary colors, the reds, the blues, the greens, the yellows with the black lines, a few triangles and circles. It just all looks kind of jotted down and scribbled on there. But when you look at it, it, it's more than abstract. You know, it's more than shapes on paper. Definitely. There's definitely a big market for Moreau's work. 
In 2012, Sotheby's set a record by selling his masterpiece, Etoile Blue, for $37 million. If this piece is real, it won't fetch millions, but it could be worth thousands. So how much do you want to get for it? Uh, 12,000, that's what I was thinking. There was an art gallery downtown about 10 years ago that had similar etchings by Moreau. Okay. And uh, they were selling anywhere between forty dollars and $70,000. You know what? I can see this going for 12000 That's not out of the ballpark for a Moreau piece. The thing is, even though his artwork is worth a lot of money, he's one of the most faked artists around from this period of time. Like, his signature is faked a lot. And I'm not a signature expert, but signature looks a little iffy to me. It kind of looks like stop and go, stop and go. Moreau had a real fluid signature. I would just like someone to come down and take a look at it. I got a art expert, Brett. He's dealt with Moreau's for a long time. So give me a few minutes, and I'm going to go call him. Absolutely, sure. I'm a little nervous to hear what the expert has to say, because I don't have a good baseline to know what it's worth. And I am also unsure if it's truly authentic. <laughs> A guy came in with a piece by the artist Joan Moreau. It's a beautiful etching, but I'm concerned Moreau's signature just doesn't look right. So I called in my favorite art expert, Brett, to come help me out. All right, let's Check see. Check this out. I don't know if we've called you down for one of these before. Ah, I don't think so. Miro, Miro on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice. Yeah, Moreau, I mean, one of the most important artists of the 20th century. I mean, he, he lived to be 90 and he lived through just about every major artistic movement of the 20th century. And that experience shows in his art. I mean, he did everything from abstraction to expressionism to surrealism. So absolutely an amazing artist. Jean Moreau is really one of the 20th century masters. He's right up there with Picasso and Matisse. He was a master of all media, from engravings to aqua tints to stone lithography. He could do it all. I am familiar with this image. I've actually seen this. The title is called Demi Mondaine at her window. You can see that this is a figure. You can see the eye. You can see the appendages here. And it's, it's probably a woman of the night uh, wearing a, an or, ornate uh, gown with you know, beautiful flowing colors and standing in front of a window. And it's a window view of the, the night sky. You've got the stars, the moon, or maybe these are city lights. I mean, this is really indicative of his late period work. Okay. Now, did you have some specific questions, Chum? I don't know if it's real. And also, the signature is not quite as flowy as I would mm. normally see from a Moreau signature. Is it okay if we put this up on the table? You're the boss. Okay, great. All right, let me take a closer look here. Yeah, I think what we have here is a, it's a mixed media print. I do see plate marks, which would be indicative of an engraving where they actually press the copper plate into the paper. You can see it kind of, uh, you know, the trace of it there. It's on the right type of paper, so. This does appear to be an original Moreau graphic. Oh, excellent, great. Okay, now this is where I run into some issues. I have seen this work and every single one that I've seen, the signature usually appears higher up within the composition below the green, and the number typically appears below this orange sphere. The signature, I'm a little worried about. There's a lack of fluidity here. I mean, it, there's a lot of breaks in the arches of the M. I think what this might be was an original graphic that somebody else signed and numbered. Oh. <laughs> which is a shame because even an original graphic that's unsigned and unnumbered is gonna be worth many thousands of dollars. It's kind of like autographing a Mickey Mantle card yourself, you know, it loses a lot of the value. Again, I can't say with 100% authenticity, but based on my experience with this particular work in Moreau, I, I just see too many red flags to advise Chum to purchase it. All right. Sorry. All right, All, right. All right, nice meeting you. Yeah, same here. All right, thank you, Chum. Yep, thanks for All coming right. in. Have a good one, guys. I'm afraid I had to advise Chum to pass on the work. Even though I think the graphic itself is genuine, there's just too many question marks about the signature and the addition for me to advise him to purchase it. So, even though he thinks it's a real Moreau graphic, I'm gonna have to pass. It's gonna be hard for me to sell. It still seems kind of fictitious. I understand. All right, thank well, you. thanks for bringing it in. It was oh, a pleasure you. to look at. Yeah, thank you. It's very disappointing to hear that it's an authentic Moreau, but someone forged Moreau's signature. Now I'll probably end up hanging up the Moreau wherever we end up staying and um, enjoying it as much as I can. 
Mm. All right, guys, who's going to the gun range with me? There's a lady in Boulder City. She just called me. She has a knock molly gun. This is possibly one of the coolest guns ever made. It's got seven barrels. At least that's what she says it is. Did you say seven barrels? Seven barrels that all go off at once. I'm in. Sharpshooter of the century right here. Do not bring him to the gun range. Chum has way too much stuff to do around here. Come on, Chum. I have to have someone fire it. So basically, you want someone to shoot it because you're yellow belly. No, I want to shoot this thing. Come on, Chum. Let's go. We got Alex beating us out there, too. There's work to do here. When did you turn into the old man? Come on, Chum. Peace, sucker. Oh, you will pay for this, Chum. A customer called the shop, and she has a knock volley gun. She lives in Boulder City, and the gun range is right in the middle, so I figured that's where we'd meet. I have never seen one of these in person, and I've been buying and selling guns for over 30 years. That is a big gun. Where in the hell did you get this? I, it's kind of a crazy story. I go to the range all the time with uh, my girls and shoot, and there's this guy, I guess, he really likes me, and he gave it to me. OK. So all right, I'm the weirdness here. of the world. The weirdness yeah, of the really world. Weird. It's actually a volley gun, but people now refer to it as the knock volley gun. I've actually never seen one in person, only behind some glass in a museum. They were just pure insanity. To put seven barrels in one gun, it's a shotgun on a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> There's only about 600 of these guns made, so it's a very rare item, and it looks to be in great condition. I'm selling this gun for $40,000 today. I think that a gun collector might find this an appealing purchase. It's an incredible gun. So have you fired this thing? I have not. I was nervous to shoot it because of the amount of kick that it probably has. Well, I, it, you literally got hit in the shoulder with a giant sledgehammer. Yeah. That actually was the chief complaint about them. They were designed, actually, for British warships. They were used in the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. Back then, sea combat, uh, the idea was to capture the other boat. You didn't want to sink it because that was a boat that you could use in your navy. So they get up alongside and they have boarding parties. And as the boarding parties came over the deck, these guys who had uh, these volley guns were up in the rigging and they would shoot down with seven barrels thinking that it would clear the decks. But the problem was seven barrels had a tremendous amount of recoil and the guys were actually dislocating their shoulders. And the other thing is, with you know 100 grains of powder in each barrel, that's 700 grains, the, the flame that came out of the end of this was like 12 feet long. So they were setting their own ships on fire. So pretty quickly, these went out of service. Knock guns are super rare. In 1780, the British government ordered 500. Then, in 1787, they ordered another 106 more. That means 606 guns, and this gun is one of them. And who knows how many ended up at the bottom of the sea. OK, so um, it's all right with you if we shoot them? Yeah, sure. OK, um, I mean, what's the worst could happen? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't blow up. Yeah, you need to be very careful with things like this. We have no idea what condition it's in inside. Uh, I'll take a look at it, and hopefully we'll be able to shoot it. OK, so you want to go grab your stuff? Yeah, and, uh... I'll go grab my stuff, and I'll be right back. Chum doesn't know that I'm not going to shoot this thing. This is a gun that was made almost 250 years ago. It's a little scary. Chum can fire it. No one will really miss him. <laughs> what do we got here? A pasta cutter. OK. It's the first American pasta cutter. It was patented in 1906 to 1920. A pasta cutter. Isn't it all kind of just a different form of lasagna, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> the pasta cutter is actually in very good condition considering its age. It's special because it came from Italian immigrant in the early 1900s. But I really don't want it, and I might as well make a few dollars on it. This looks cool. They had these for years and years and years. Italians came to the United States. People liked their food. People started buying it. It became you know, a really big market. They had to find different ways to make it faster. Pasto basically was cheap, affordable food that you know, even the poorest guy could feed his family. Right. Do you have different like attachments for it? Yeah, huh? Yeah, they have different, different cutters for the different pastas. You put the different rollers in here. You put the pasta through, and it comes out. 
It'd be a great display piece. You're hard selling the hell out of this pasta cutter. Am I? <laughs> The one thing you definitely have going here, though, is that people do collect stuff like this for their kitchens. They like this old antique stuff in there. What are you looking to do with it? I'm looking to sell it. How much are you looking to get? $500. I'm sorry, if Chef Boyardee himself made this thing, I wouldn't give you $500 for it. I mean, it, it's just really not that old for a pasta cutter. I mean, you're looking around $100. Uh, how about 175 $100. No. $100 is definitely the most I'm going to pay. That's it? It really is. $100? What about $115? Sure, if it makes you happy. <laughs> OK. All right. It makes it. me happy. C Thank come you. with me. We've got to do some paperwork. <laughs> I'm settling on $115, and I'd like to give the money to my sister, because she investigated and found out what the pasta cutter was. So I think she should have the money. If I'm lucky, maybe she'll take me out to an Italian dinner. We're here at the gun range checking out a knock volley gun. This gun is one of the rarest of the rare. But first, we have to make sure this thing is even safe to fire. So Alex is checking it out, and hopefully we got some good news. All right, so I inspected it. Uh, the chambers are clear. The action's working well. So I'm feeling comfortable that we can actually shoot this thing. But oh, I... whoa, 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 you can shoot this. What about the wee thing, OK? That's why you're out here. You can shoot it. I still have children at home. I was just going to offer to be the guinea pig, right? Okay. I definitely want to shoot it. Why don't you let me shoot it? I think people will miss me less, and they'll miss you. And then I don't I care when maybe... I shoot it, as long as I shoot it. All right. So I had the range guys set up a cool target for us. We've got a big jug of uh, green colored water. I'm hoping it'll make that thing explode. All right, let's see this. All right. This is a true piece of history. I'm like, I get excited about it because I don't get to see things quite like this really ever, and you never get to shoot them. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. Oh! <laughs> well, I don't think I hit it. I think I hit the barrel. <laughs> Alex fired it and didn't even come close to the target. So it's going to be fun to watch Chum shoot this. <laughs> All right, Chum, come on over. Get ready and see perfection at its finest, Rick. All right, Chum, she's ready. When you pull the trigger, it should go boom. Good luck, Chum. Hope you like your fingers. Nice work, Job. That's what I'm talking about. Only one here who can hit the target. You'd have cleared the deck. Hey, it's something I'm good at. I usually clear the dance floor. <laughs> Chum's never fired one of these things before. They don't have sights. Once again, Chum is the luckiest person on the planet. So what do these things go for? It, there's only been a few that have come up at auction. Um, most of them are in museums. The ones I've found that have gone through auction are about 25,000, but this is really special. It's got all the right markings. It's perfectly functional. I would value this at thirty-five dollars to $40,000. Okay. I think this is one of the best buys the shop could make. The collector's market for a knock volley gun is voracious. This one has all the right markings, and it is absolutely perfect. It functions. It fires. It, was, it had no problems at all. So this is really special. I mean, what's your best price on it? Um, I would take 38 for it. You'd take less than that. It was a gift. I'll give you 28 for it. I have to make money. I think that's a little bit low. How about 30? You know what? I'll give you the 30 grand for it. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, just bring it with you to, over to the pawn shop. We'll do okay. some paperwork, and I'll give you a check or cash or whatever you want. Sounds okay? great. Thank you so right, much. Cool. I'll see you there. OK, see you there. Ooh, I got a gun, dude. Oh, man. <laughs> I feel like Santa came to town. <laughs> I think I made a great deal. I usually don't get giddy over things. I'm a little bit giddy over this gun. There's just so few of them out there. So I'm going to do all right in this. 
I think I'll get close to 40,000 for it. What do you think, chum? I think you're a little chicken. You should have shot it. I'm not chicken. You're definitely yellow belly. Oh, shut up, chum.